Hi, I'm Abby Dernberg. I'm on the faculty at UC Berkeley. And today, I'm going to give you an introduction to meiosis, the specialized cell division that gives rise to sex cells, like sperm or eggs or pollen. Uh, people started noticing in the mid-19th century, when they started looking through the microscope at stained cells, they would notice these uh, dark bodies in the nucleus. And they started looking at the process of cell division, um, first looking at this process of mitosis that's much more familiar to most biologists than meiosis. Um, during mitosis, the goal is to replicate chromosomes and then segregate them to daughter cells so that you create two daughter cells that are basically the same as the, the mother cell. So in order to accomplish this, chromosomes undergo DNA replication, and then they condense so that we can actually see them. They line up um, at the center of the cell. This mitotic spindle forms. And eventually, the, the glue, the cohesion that holds chromosomes together uh, gets severed and allows the chromosomes to segregate to opposite poles to create two new daughter cells. So meiosis is a little bit different. So the fundamental goal of meiosis is to take a cell that has two sets of chromosomes, the, the set that was inherited from the father and the set from the mother, um, and to divide those chromosomes to produce cells that have only a single set of chromosomes. And those haploid cells then go on to develop as sperm or eggs or pollen or spores. So how does this specialized uh, reductional cell division process work? What really differentiates mitosis and meiosis is the fact that the chromosomes that are going to segregate in the first meiotic division do not start out together. So in mitosis, chromosomes undergo replication, and so you have two sisters. But they're held together by cohesion, and they stay together until they're going to segregate. So they don't have to find each other. But in meiosis, the goal, as I said, is to separate the two copies of the chromosome that you got from your two parents. And in order for that to happen, those chromosomes, which are called homologs, have to first pair with each other. And, and we don't know exactly how they do that. I'll, I'll have more to say about that in, in other segments. But somehow, through a mysterious process, they come together, they find each other, they recognize each other, and they pair up along their entire lengths. And they form this mysterious uh, sort of glue that we call the synaptonemal complex that holds them together for much of meiosis. They also have to undergo recombination. And that means that the DNA has to get cut and repaired in a special way that connects homologous chromosomes. So DNA is cut, and it's repaired in a way that physically connects homologous chromosomes. And this process of recombination is thought to be sort of the raison d'etre of meiosis. It's thought to be the reason that eukaryotes have taken over uh, the Earth and have achieved such diversity and complexity of their form, because they undergo recombination. And the idea is that that enables mutations to arise um, that are beneficial, and for those mutations to be separated from the deleterious mutations, which are much more common, um, in an efficient way, so that uh, evolution can happen at an accelerated pace compared to asexual reproduction. And because this recombination process is so central to what meiosis is all about, it is also uh, physically essential for this process. Recombination is actually re necessary to create the link between chromosomes that enables them to stay together until they go and get ready to divide. So basically, uh, by forming this crossover and being held together by cohesion, the, the two homologous chromosomes can then biorient, meaning they can face the, the two poles of the meiotic spindle and segregate towards opposite poles. This whole process of pairing and synapsis and recombination takes place during a long period that we call meiotic prophase. It can last anywhere from about 24 hours to many days, depending on the organism and the complexity of the genome. Once the chromosomes have accomplished pairing synapses and recombination, they, they eventually get ready to divide, they condense, and they segregate um, in two successive cell divisions. First, the homologous chromosomes separate from each other, and then the, the sister chromatids come apart as they do during mitosis. And, um, this requires a lot of interesting vari variations on what happens during mitosis. In particular, in mitosis, the, the, the sister uh, kinetochores, the centromeres, have to separate. But here, they actually have to stay together during the first division and separate at the second division. And likewise, during mitosis, 
when, when chromosomes are ready to divide, they simply release the cohesion that's holding them together. But in meiosis, that cohesion has to be uh, released in two steps. First, partially to allow the homologs to separate, and then the rest of the cohesion is released to allow the sisters to separate. So all of this requires a ver uh, modification of the mitotic cell cycle, some of which we understand and some of which is still areas of very active research. So it, we're interested in meiosis from, from the standpoint of understanding this very fundamental cellular process that's shared by almost all eukaryotes. And we're also interested in understanding how errors in meiosis arise partly because they give rise to many human um, birth defects. And, and this is the best known example, um, Down syndrome, which is when uh, uh, an infant inherits an extra copy of a small chromosome, chromosome 21. Um, this almost always happens due to errors in female meiosis in, in, uh, in humans. Male meiosis, even though uh, it, it happens much more abundantly, humans make many more sperm than they make oocytes, um, is actually much more faithful and, and less error prone um, for reasons that we don't really understand. So um, we, we want to understand how these chromosome segregation events occur, what regulates the whole process. And it's, it's very difficult to study in humans, partly because all of these meiotic events, pairing and recombination, um, and all happen in the ovaries um, when um, when a, when a fetus is still in utero. So, so that makes it kind of inaccessible. Um, on the other hand, it's quite easy to study in some model organisms. And the one that, that my lab uses to study meiosis is the nematode, uh, Sanorhabditis elegans. Um, it's a great uh, experimental system. These are small roundworms. They're very widely used in, in studies of uh, neural development and other developmental processes. So one of the great advantages of using C. elegans to study meiosis has to do with the, just the anatomy of this animal. Um, these are very small animals. They're about a millimeter long. In a, in a wild population, most of the animals are hermaphrodites. So they make both eggs and sperm, and they fertilize their own eggs with their own sperm. Um, the animals are very small. They're about a millimeter long. And most of the, the interior of an adult animal is actually the germline the tissue that gives rise to meiotic nuclei and eventually to the progeny. Um, the, the germline in this animal is organized within these two arms of the gonad that, that have a sort of horseshoe-like structure. And what's wonderful about the system is that the, the gonad contains a complete uh, a gradient of, of meiotic stages. And so it's very clear where each thing is happening within this animal. Um, in the distal region of the gonad, there are these uh, proliferative zones where nuclei are just dividing mitotically. And then as nuclei sort of get pushed away from the distal tip of the gonad and move um, towards the, the uterus, the, the nuclei enter meiosis. They go through the stage that we call the transition zone, which is where pairing and synapsis occur. Um, and they initiate meiotic recombination, which is complete by mid um, And then eventually, the chromosomes start to condense, and they segregate. First, they give rise to a, a pool of sperm, and then oocytes, which pass through the spermatheca, get fertilized, and, and the resulting cells start dividing internally as embryos. So it's very easy to see where everything is happening during meiosis. We can dissect out the gonads from adult animals and, and stain them with a variety of, of uh, reagents to visualize specific proteins or, or DNA sequences. Um, and as I'll talk about in another segment, we can also take advantage of the fact that these animals are transparent, and we can put them under a cover slip and actually watch meiosis in living animals. Um, so if we dissect out the gonad and stain it with here a dye that's, that, that, that binds to DNA called DAPI, what we see is all the individual nuclei. So that's what you're seeing here. Each little sphere is a, a single nucleus. Um, what you're looking at about, you're looking at a projection through about half of this gonad. It's actually a a tube, kind of like an ear of corn, where the nuclei are arranged around sort of a central matrix. Um, and as I described, here in the distal region, there's a, this pool of uh, prolifer proliferating premiotic nuclei. And then we can sort of tell right when meiosis starts, because the nuclei take on a sort of different appearance. They, the, they look more crescent-shaped if we look at the, the DNA. We call that the transition zone. And we know that that's where pairing and synapsis occur. Um, and recombination is initiated. Um, recombination is completed 
And then eventually, as I said, the chromosomes condense. And at this point in diakinesis, what we see are these six little cruciform structures, which are the six pairs of chromosomes that are held together by the fact that they've undergone crossover recombination. Um, so we can see everything that's happening. And, and one way that we identify uh, the, the specific molecular components that are involved in driving this process is through genetics. And that turns out to be relatively easy in C. elegans, um, partly because of the mechanism of sex determination in this organism. So as I described, in a, in a wild population of C. elegans, most animals are hermaphrodites. And they have six pairs of chromosomes, which is a really nice small number. Uh, humans, for example, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's a lot more to contend with. Uh, and, and so with six pairs of chromosomes, it's quite easy to visualize each chromosome individually in the nucleus. Um, so males are produced by C. elegans. And that's very important for doing genetics, because that's the only way we can cross two genotypes together. They're usually at a, at a low fraction of the population. And males are basically the same as hermaphrodites, except they have a single X chromosome. So where do males come from? So it turns out that in this organism, uh, males arise through what are basically errors in meiosis. And what I mean by that is if you have a hermaphrodite, which has two X chromosomes, if, if it goes through meiosis and it, to make either sperm or oocytes, what should happen is that those two X chromosomes should pair and they should segregate away from each other. And every sperm and every oocyte should get a single X chromosome. And so when a sperm fertilizes an oocyte, you should restore the, the XX chromosome content that gives a hermaphrodite. But it turns out that uh, at a low rate in, a, in a, a normal animal, but at an elevated rate in meiotic mutants, you can see missegregation of the X chromosome. So the X chromosome will get lost or missegregated during meiosis. And as a result, you'll have a sperm or an oocyte that doesn't have an X chromosome. And at fertilization, that can give rise to an XO or male animal. So in a normal animal, that happens only about uh, 1 in 500 meioses give rise to a, a, a oocyte or spermatocyte lacking an X chromosome. In a meiotic mutant, though, what you get is far fewer viable progeny, lots of males, and lots of dead embryos that arise because the other chromosomes are also missegregating. And, and if uh, an animal inherits the wrong number of those chromosomes, it's usually inviable. So many screens have given uh, us a, a wealth of mutants. They often are called HIM for high incidence of males mutants. Um, and they're often identified by putting individual worms on plates and looking at their, their broods, their progeny, to, to find ones that are throwing lots of males. There's sort of a cute shortcut that was um, invented by Anne Villeneuve, which uses a, a clever way to identify animals that are going to throw lots of males without having to put them on individual plates. It takes advantage of this ZOL1 GFP reporter. So ZOL1 is a, a gene that's normally expressed only in male embryos. And if a, if a hermaphrodite, which is what we're looking at here, is a him mutant, so it's going to produce lots of males, and it's, and it's got this ZOL1 GFP reporter, its embryos inside it will be green and fluorescing. And so we can use that as a way to identify hermaphrodites that are meiotic mutants um, and screen more efficiently. And as I said, Anne Villeneuve invented the screen, and it's called, after the Dr. Seuss book, the Green Eggs and Him Screen. So that, that has given us lots of uh, specific mutants that have told us a lot about this meiotic process and how it works. So one of the key things that my lab is interested in, and many people in the field are interested in, is this process of homolog pairing. It's unique to meiosis. How do chromosomes find their partners inside the nucleus? And what is it that tells them that this is your partner and you should pair up with it? Um, I'm not going to be able to answer those questions for you, because we are still actively working on understanding this. But I'll tell you a little bit about what we've learned. Um, and I'll start with some something we learned about how they don't pair. So back when I started working on meiosis, we used to think of the process of meiotic prophase in this very linear way. We imagined that chromosomes, as I described, would undergo pairing and synapsis, and then they would undergo recombination. And the logic of that was obvious. If, if you're sitting right next to your homologous chromosome, then it, when your DNA is cut and you have to repair it, you have a homologous chromosome right next to you that you can undergo recombination with. And so this seemed to make sense as, as a way to kind of structure this process. However, uh, 
in the, in the early 1990s, uh, Scott Keeney and Nancy Kleckner provided evidence that, that this sort of linear view of this process was probably not quite right, at least in, in the budding yeast, S. cerevisiae. What they found is they identified the enzyme that actually cuts the DNA to initiate meiotic recombination. It's called SPO11. Um, but what they, they observed is that mutations in SPO11 don't just disrupt this process of recombination. Um, instead, they actually disrupt the process of pairing and synapsis. So that tells us that in this budding yeast, and it turns out also in plants and in mammals, um, the process of pairing and synapsis requires the early stages of meiotic recombination. Um, so when I started working on meiosis and C. elegans, we didn't really know if this was the case, and we wanted to test it. Um, and as I said, we have uh, the advantage of being able to actually observe the formation of recombination products, these, these uh, uh, conjoined bivalent chromosomes. And we, we were able to identify the SPO11 homologue, the, the gene encoding the worm SPO11 in the genome, and to obtain a mutation in that gene. And what we could see immediately was, whereas in a wild-type animal, as I described, there are these six, um, each oocyte contains these six these uh, cruciform bivalent structures, which are the six chromosomes that have undergone recombination, when we looked at SPO11 mutants, what we see is different. In each oocyte, we see 12 univalent chromosomes, meaning that they are not attached to their partner. And that tells us that, as in budding yeast, SPO11 is required to make crossovers. Um, we wanted to know if SPO11 was also required for the process of pairing and synapsis. And we can monitor that in a variety of ways. Here's, here's one way that we do that. This is just a blow up of a region of the gonad, the region of the gonad where pairing and synapsis occur. As I described, it's called the transition zone. And here we're looking at uh, these orange spots, which are due to in situ hybridization. So we've made a probe that uh, hybridizes with a particular locus in the genome. And if the chromosomes have not yet paired, you see two spots. Um, by the time they're in pachyteen down here at the right uh, bottom, they have all paired in synapse, and so every nucleus has just one big spot or a, a, a very close pair of spots. And in this transition zone, that's where pairing and synapses occur. So it was very straightforward for us to look at this SPO11 mutant, and we could tell right away that, that chromosomes had no difficulty pairing and synapsing in, in the absence of SPO11, suggesting that things were a little bit different than they are in budding yeast. Um, we needed to prove, though, that SPO11 really just is, is only required to make double-strand breaks in C. elegans. And the way we tested that uh, was basically uh, the idea of how we... <laughs> we tested that using um, an experiment that recapitulated an old experiment in budding yeast in which we took SPO11 mutants and we subjected them to radiation, which, of course, breaks DNA. And so the idea is that if SPO11 is only needed to make double-strand breaks, to make breaks during meiosis, then radiation should partially substitute for that function. And we were able to show that in SPO11 animals, if we irradiated them, there was a burst of, uh, of greater progeny viability um, than in unirradiated animals. And so, indeed, we could demonstrate that the function of SPO11 is specifically to make double-strand breaks, but, as I said, it's dispensable for pairing and synapsis. And this just shows cytologically that when we irradiated SPO11 animals, um, we were able to restore crossing over, and we could detect that as these bivalents um, in the oocytes. Okay, so apparently pairing and synapsis in C. elegans does not require double-strand break formation, implying it really doesn't require the, the recombination machinery um, which acts at those double-strand break sites. So how do chromosomes pair and synapse? And as I said, this is still a big mystery, but I'll tell you in, in um, my additional segments what we've learned about this process so far. <laughs>